Uh, yay, hello, what's up? It's that time again. Welcome back to our monthly look at new games. No preamble with this one. Let's just get right into it, starting with my top picks, what I think are the best looking new games coming out in this month of August 2023. These will be listed in order of release date. Kicking things off, Baldur's Gate 3. Man, you know you got a good game when other developers in the industry are coming up publicly saying that we shouldn't let it raise our expectations because it's so good. It's too good that it would be unfair to to set a high bar for other studios. That is exactly what has happened with Baldur's Gate 3. Funny enough, similar situation happened uh, around the release of Elden Ring. But anyways, yeah, seems like if you like old school D&D laden CRPGs with a lot of player agency, variety, and thousands of potential outcomes, this will be one to play. It is a bit of deja vu for me as I could have sworn I played this game nearly three years ago because I did. It first released into early access in October, 2020. And even back then with what was a fraction of a game, I I was pretty impressed. Well, that fraction of a game has now been finished and it is whole at this point and by all accounts is shaping up to be very, very good. So here's the quick rundown. This was developed by Larian Studios, creators of Divinity Original Sin 1 and 2. They are referring to Baldur's Gate 3 as a story-rich, party-based, next-generation RPG, an evolution of their successful formula with their first two games, set in the world, of course, of Dungeons and Dragons, where the choices that we make shape a tale of fellowship and betrayal. The game has got seven unique origin heroes for you to pick from. These will offer handcrafted experiences. Each of them have their own unique traits, agenda, and outlook on the world with stories that intersect with the overarching narrative where your choices will drastically influence that. Or beyond that, there's also a robust character creator with unprecedented levels of customization. It features 31 sub races on top of the 11 core races and 46 sub classes branching out of the 12 base classes. All told, there's over 600 spells and actions, which offer loads of freedom in the game's handcrafted and highly interactable world. Pretty much everything in the environment, every object, everything you can think of can be picked up or moved or interacted with or exploded or set a booby trap or whatever. Super, super immersive interactive play space. It's based on the D&D 5e rule set. It's got team-based initiative, advantage and disadvantage, and role modifiers combined with advanced AI, expanded environmental interactions, like I just mentioned, and a combat system that rewards strategy and foresight. There are three different difficulty settings, letting you customize the challenge of your combat and over 174 hours of cinematics. Uh, and no wonder de uh, developers are complaining. That is a, <laughs> this is a 174 hours of cinematics in this game. Are you kidding me? On top of that, this game can be played multiplayer online with up to four players. Yeah, I mean, like I said, when I played this a few years ago, I thought it was really good then. And at this point, it seems to have just gotten significantly better. Pretty awesome to hear. Baldur's Gate 3 coming on August 3rd to PC for $59.99. It is then releasing on PS5 on August 6th for $69.99 because Sony is, yeah, they're gonna be charging you those extra $10 for just about everything. Before we get into the next game though, a word from today's sponsor. Today's video is sponsored by Sky Skillshare, an online community with thousands of classes for learning a variety of things. There's crafts and hobbies, including photography, design, and illustration, as well as hundreds of career-focused classes. Whatever it is you may be looking to improve or learn more about, Skillshare likely has something for you. Traditional work and jobs are not one-size-fits-all in today's economy. I know this very well myself, and there are many diverse ways to make a living, while well, Skillshare aims to help you learn how to design a career that fits well for you. You don't have to take one huge class either. You could start small, learn some minor skills, and think that might have a major impact for you. I've liked the productivity and time management course as it is always helpful to get refreshers and reminders on how to best manage your time. And I'd also like to check out the marketing your brand and business class, seeing as my YouTube logo is still a decade old at this point, could use a freshening up. If you'd like to check out Skillshare for yourself, the first 1000 people to use a link in the description below will get a one month free Skillshare trial. All right, next up on this month's list is Atlas Fallen. You know, it's always nice to see a mid-sized studio find success and build a strong following off of the back of well-regarded, albeit relatively niche games. And Deck 13 is one such developer. 2017's The Surge was one of those lesser known, but much beloved by those who played it, Souls-inspired ARPGs. They followed it up in 2019 with The Surge 2, which similarly did pretty well. And now, four years later, they're about to release something that's a bit different. So Atlas Fallen is an action RPG, but this time is it is way less Souls and a bit more uh, Monster Hunter meets Forspoken, 
meets like modern day action RPG. The game is set in this vast desert landscape, which you traverse by more or less surfing at high speeds through the sand. And yes, that is where the Forspoken comparison comes into play. And hopefully it's the only point of comparison because as we know, Forspoken didn't turn out to be that good of a game. But beyond that, uh, there's other movement abilities. You got double jumping, dashing, and the ability to float. And mobility is gonna play a big role in combat as well as the game has a fair amount of flyers and large enemies with weak points that are high up that you have to traverse in order to reach uh, breaking down the breaking down their armor basically and exposing them to more damage. It's got an action combat system with the usual fare of light and heavy attacks. There's active dodging, parrying, and a combo system. You've got this gauntlet that will transform into three different weapons, each with their own strengths and use cases, all of which is further enhanced by this momentum system. So the longer you're engaged in combat, the more momentum you build up. This in turn makes your attacks deal more damage, but it also progressively unlocks access to stronger abilities. It basically works in three tiers, and as you progress the tiers, you can then use those abilities with the higher tier abilities doing more damage and just being stronger. The game's actually got over 150 essence stones, which you can either find or craft, and these function as active and passive abilities. So there's a lot of variety, lots of different things you can choose from. So they're calling this a semi-open world. You've got these large play spaces that are broken up into different sections. You'll explore, collecting unique items, armor, and essences, searching for ways to get access to locked areas or hard to reach areas. All the while, you're fighting through a variety of different basic enemies, elite enemies, and major boss battles. Also, this is a story-driven game. It can be played solo, but also has two-player co-op. Atlas Fallen is coming to PS5, Xbox, and PC on August 10th for $49.99. Wayfinder is an upcoming action combat character-based MMO light. It takes inspiration from things like Warframe with a gameplay loop, character, and progression systems, familiar from that game, and puts it into these open zone areas that you will explore seeing other players, which is kind of where the MMO light elements come into play. Uh, I played this game for around 40 hours a few months ago, and while I do have some early concerns, overall I enjoyed my time and I am looking forward to seeing more. I would say probably one of its stronger features is a fairly well-executed action combat system that feels pretty good to play. Uh, there also appears to be a decent amount of enemy uh, design and encounter variety, which I love to see. The game's features include those open world zones. These are shared spaces. You're gonna see other players running around doing a variety of just the open world activities. Beyond fighting groups of various types of monsters in the open world, you're also gonna find public events, world bosses, various points of interest like landmarks, vistas, and various secrets to discover. There are side quests and objectives to do and collectibles. The game has a system of instance procedural dungeons where they take tile sets, rearrange them in different layouts and placements so that every run feels different, which is pretty important because these instance dungeons, you'll be running a lot. They make up for a majority probably of your playtime as this is where you go to farm a lot of the progression related things, the resources, the currencies, and the loot. Besides changing things up with the procedural nature, there's also these dungeon mutations, which will further, further mix things up, add variety, increasing the challenge for better rewards. And then also one big thing with this game is it features a, a character system rather than classes. So the game has six playable characters. These are distinct. They've got specific names. They are fully voice acted and they each have unique abilities, play styles, and backstories. So think along the line of the Warframes in frames or what you would get for characters in a MOBA. You're not picking the warrior class. You're playing a specific character with a specific name who has four default abilities. And those abilities, while they have some level enhancement and they can be modified somewhat with certain pieces of gear, for the most part, the four abilities of each character are the four abilities. Oh, every other person you see who's playing that character also has those same four abilities. There are a variety of different passives as well. And the big chance for variety with each of the characters is actually the weapon because the weapon basically functions beyond having a different attack pattern, you know, melee or ranged or whatever, different attack speeds, different attack combos. Weapons will also have unique abilities attached to them. They kind of function as your fifth ability, and there will be multiple variations of each weapon type in the game. Uh, lots of different progression systems in this game. You'll be upgrading your characters, your weapons. There are accessories, which are your types of gear, echoes, which are powerful gems that will enhance your gear. And then there's also a affinity system. You level it up, you get stronger. There's also social towns in this game. You're gonna go here. There's NPCs to pick up quests, buy and sell items. This is also where you can set out on expeditions, which are just repeatable dungeon grinds, craft weapons and gear here, customizable player housing will also be here. And yes, there's social hubs. So you're going to see other players running around as well. Wayfinder is coming out on August 15th. It is first launching in 
into early access. Now, in order to get into early access, you will have to buy this Founders Pack. But when the game officially releases, but I'm assuming sometime next year into 1.0, it is going to be fully free to play with monetization coming through the visual customization side of things. Okay, next up, Shadow Gambit The Cursed Crew. This is a stealth strategy game set in the Caribbean during an alternate history of the Golden Age of Piracy. You'll gather a crew of ghost pirates with magical abilities that you will use to infiltrate islands in search of long lost treasure. The developer, Mamimi Games, has stated that their goal with Shadow Gambit is to push and evolve the stealth strategy genre, and it seems like they may have done that. Some of the early hands-on impression from a few months ago came back fairly positive, primarily touting the game's expansive size, unique mechanics, abilities, and world interactions that make for a fun twist on this genre of game. So you've got this base of operations known as your ghost pirate ship, and you will use that to sail around, going to different islands that you will then infiltrate, pulling off heists and salvaging treasure, infiltrating fortresses, sneaking behind enemy lines by staying in the shadows, and combining the magical skills of your crew. So as you play, you're going to come across other dead pirates who you will then revive, adding them to your crew. There's eight of them in total, each with their own um, different unique special supernatural powers. Like there's one who will let you launch friend or foe out of a magical cannon. There's a soul anchor that you can use to open up portals, teleporting all over the place. Get some really unique abilities and potential interactions here. So before each mission, you will select from the crewmates that you have available that you want to bring with you. And then you also plan a path to enter and exit each island and it's your choice. You want to go in stealthy or you want to go head on, guns blazing, using your abilities, manipulating the environment to your advantage. There's going to be a lot of options here as to how you approach and take on every one of the game's islands. And the islands themselves are these unique handcrafted locations with a lot of different sandbox elements that you can play with in conjunction with your various abilities. This game seems pretty cool. From what I've heard, it seems like it's fairly well done. Looking forward to it. Shadow Gambit The Cursed Crew is coming to PS5, Xbox, and PC on August 17th. You know, a single player magic focus FPS and a brand new IP from EA wasn't on my bingo card for 2023, but here we are. Immortals of Avium will feature a roughly 25 hour story driven campaign set in this fantasy sci fi world that's under siege, with you being the last line of defense. Who would have thought? Uh, this is a story driven game. It's chapter based. So you're going to start in chapter one. You play through these levels. It, the levels themselves are designed in a way to focus on the moment to moment gameplay with a little bit of exploration and puzzle solving here and there. But yeah, you go through the story, you fight things, you kill bosses, you pick up loot, and then you progress to chapter two, so on and so on. The developer has actually described this as a semi open corridor shooter with metroidvania like elements so you move through a space you'll find an area that you can't go across a gap you can't jump a door you can't open and eventually you find the means of progressing whether that's a new ability or a key letting you get past that obstacle and move forward there's some light puzzle solving in the game as well but for the most part you'll be engaging in combat and so the combat itself uh it's what they're re referring to as a first person action spell slinger you've got magical abilities that basically function as their fps counterparts so you're going to have spells that are like rifle ones that are like SMGs, like shotguns, like swords. There's also a wide range of offensive, defensive, and utility abilities. In total, the game's got 25 spells broken up into distinct categories, as well as elements with the different elements used to counter different enemy defenses. There's gear in the game that's also broken into four categories, sigils, totems, rings, and bracers. All of the loot is predetermined. It's pre-placed with a set name, so a certain piece will always be in that chest or always drop off that boss, for example. There's no randomization no randomized stats, no randomized drops, nothing. While the game does have gear, it is absolutely not a looter shooter. They made sure to say that. Outside of the gear, there's also further progression via skill tree, one for each school of magic with over 80 talents to choose from. They've also said you have to specialize. You cannot unlock everything. There just won't be enough skill points, but there is a respec option if you do want to play around with different builds. And speaking of replayability, they have said this game is going to last in the ballpark of 25 hours. Again, it's story driven, it's chapter based, so 25 hours roughly roughly for a full playthrough. There's three different difficulty modes, easy, medium, and hard with scaling damage and health, as well as more aggressive AI, the harder you go. And they said there is some post credits content, but they've kind of kept it under wraps exactly what it is saying while there isn't something like new game plus, there will be reasons to go back and revisit chapters that you've already played through as things will be different. Things will have changed. Immortals of AVM is coming to PS5, Xbox, PC, and PC on August 22nd for $59.99. Armored Core 
Star 6. This is an interesting one. I think this looks really, really good. I've been excited for this game. Everything I've seen looks awesome, but man, has the discourse around this title been really rough online. People looking forward to the next FromSoft title and then other people gatekeeping them, saying they shouldn't be. It's nothing like Souls, which I mean, Duh. and that saying that they should keep soul fans and souls design philosophy away from the armored core franchise it's been exhausting to follow but honestly forget all of that who cares i've heard mostly good things from the early impressions the game seems like it'll be fun and that is all i care about the different corners of a developer's fan base bickering online i can't be bothered armored core 6 looks sick. Piloting mechs with a lot of customization through this wide array of levels. I think they said there might be like 80 to 100 levels in total while taking on mechs and gargantuan bosses all on the backdrop of this desolate planet that's been bombarded by cosmic fire and is also in the grip of a never ending war. Man, that is a video game ass video game and I cannot wait. General overview here, combat in Armored Core 6 looks to be combining the mechanics from the original series of Armored Core games with a bit of a modern day twist, adding some of the lessons FromSoft has learned from their Soul series. Uh, the game's going to make use of Armored Core's three-dimensional combat, of course, its mission structure, its atmosphere, and its customization, but that will be combined with things like hard lock targeting, the pacing, and attack telegraphs from boss battles often seen in the Souls franchise. They still have the soft lock, similar to how traditional Armored Core games have worked. When you get within range of enemies, your missiles will prime and automatically lock on to the closest target, but then on top of that, there is hard lock, letting you manually focus single targets, just like many other modern-day action RPG games. A typical assortment of weapons, machine guns, missiles, cannons, and other ordnance. You've got four weapon slots that you can mix and match as you please, depending on your specific core. There's also a system of shields with perfectly timed blocks and a variety of melee weapons to choose from. The game's got a stagger system where you can stagger enemies for increased damage or opening them up to be kicked off of the map. And the assault boost letting you dash forward either to charge enemies or to avoid incoming attacks. Lots of different movement and utility abilities. Of course, you can fly using your boosters and thrusters. There's also an x-ray scan where you can see enemies through hard objects. There's these different expansions with things like radar jams, EMPs, flares, and even repair kits, adding healing to the game, which I'm fairly sure is relatively new to the core series, but I'm not a hardcore fan, right? So I probably shouldn't talk about Armored Core. Big boss battles, that is absolutely gonna see, be a thing. We saw some of this in the early impressions that came out uh, like last week or so. These bosses look awesome. These fights look awesome. I cannot wait to learn and engage with these systems. Should be really, really enjoyable. And then also the game's designed so it's not open world. It follows in the footsteps of prior Armored Core games using that mission-based structure. You go through missions, following the narrative, moving from one story beat and location to the next, taking on bosses, completing the mission, and then going on to the next mission. Most of the missions will consist of levels that have multiple paths, providing some variety in how you approach them. You'll take on different groups of enemies, go through different challenging encounters, open various gates, and of course, fight in those massive boss battles. And then it would not be an Armored Core game without customization, and you can customize just about everything for your core, its unit, frame, inner categories. Uh, the system is clearly a bit more streamlined when compared to prior Armored Core games, but still looks to have a fair bit of depth to it. Armored Core 6 Fires of Rubicon is coming to PS5, Xbox, and PC on August 25th for $59.99. All right, so those are the main games, what I think are the best looking, most promising new games coming out this month, but as usual, we got quite a few honorable mentions. First up is Sengoku Dynasty, an open world survival game set in feudal Japan. It's going to feature a variety of biomes with forest mountains, cherry groves, and hot springs. It's called an open world village builder. You're going to start off small, building up a little little village and then expanding it into a massive settlement. There's, of course, all of the crafting and building you expect, a variety of melee and range weapons with these unique Japanese weapons like the Yari, Yumi, and Katanas. It's also got dynasty management as you oversee the growth and development of your village to create a prosperous dynasty, and it can be played solo or co-op, letting you join other players in the survival game. Sengoku Dynasty comes out on August. 10th. Also on August 10th is Tales and Tactics, a squad-based auto battler in a tabletop RPG setting. Draft an army, equip and position your units, make the important choices, and then watch them go to battle. You might remember the craze of auto battlers from a few years back with like Teamfight Tactics and Dota Underlords. Well, this is basically a new twist on that genre. And something a bit different is that this one is actually entirely single player. It's not competitive multiplayer and has a bit more of a story focus. Interesting choice. Looks pretty neat. We'll see how
how it turns out. On August 16th, we've got End Guard, a swashbuckling action game where it mixes fencing with a bit of comedy and some silly physics. You'll parry your post and lunge your way to victory, fighting with style as you fill your panache meter to unlock special skills. The combat areas are full of various opportunities to experiment with the environment as you surprise, stun, or evade enemies with various objects from rolling barrels to falling chandeliers. There's an arena mode with game-changing modifiers for new fight situations. There are theatrical characters in a story-driven experience. And one interesting note is this was, was originally prototyped as a student project. They then formed a studio, increased the game size and scope, and are now releasing a full version. Pretty cool story. I like to hear it. End Guard comes out on August 16th. On August 22nd is Fort Solace, a story-driven thriller set on the Red Planet, otherwise known as Mars. Uh, responding to an unusual alarm call from a remote mining base. Of course, it's a remote mining base. You arrive in a dark and desolate Fort Solace, head in, your head inside because there's an imminent storm. Of course, there's an imminent storm. And then as nighttime approaches, events escalate and spiral out of control. Of course, they spiral out of control. It's an, it's an, it's another horror game. Um, the story is told in four, across four chapters, immersive storytelling, they've said, with grinded visuals and animations running on Unreal Engine 5. It will be spooky. Fort Solace comes out on August 22nd. Then on August 24th is Blasphemous 2. This is a 2D Metroidvania. Now, the original Blasphemous, which released in 2019, is well regarded. It still has very positive ratings on Steam. The sequel, they look to continue the story and expand upon the game with a fuller, non-linear world. You can explore and advance basically in any direction you please. They've improved combat, more customization, and more massive, interesting boss battles. Blasphemous 2, again, August 24th. And then on August 31st, we have Trine 5. I did not realize they were still making Trine games. I remember playing those first two. Uh, so Trine has returned with the biggest adventure yet for this 2.5D puzzle platformer. It's set in this beautiful fantasy world with stunning visuals. I always felt that actually about the original Trines. I really loved the way they looked. There's a new and improved combat system, character specific skill quest system for more depth and play style variety, more puzzles, levels, and battles than previous entries, customizable outfits with cosmetics, and combined forces with one to four players, either single player or local and or online co-op. And that was actually one of the cool things about this game is that you could play it simultaneously a puzzle platformer with other people each controlling your own characters always liked it had a great time with my friends playing the original trines but yeah there you go trine 5 august 31st those are the list of games we do also have a couple of beta tests i want to know you about palia is going to have an open beta on august 10th this is a uh, mmo it's not really an mmo it's more of like a building management game from everything i've seen and heard i'll be talking about this a little bit more in the future uh but don't expect full-blown mmo just remove MMO from your mind when you consider what Pally is. You're building bases and, um, farming. That's the game. The First Descendant also has an open beta. I'm pretty excited for this. This is going to be on August 22nd. This is that third person MMO light looter shooter. Uh, I think it was last year was the last beta or earlier in this year, whenever it was. I played it for like a week straight and it was kind of janky, really rough around the edges, probably going to be super predatory monetization, but the game itself had some really cool things. It had this shared world system, kind of think Destiny, where you're out there and you're seeing other people doing quests and objectives, fighting bosses, really cool boss battles. And what I actually particularly loved about the game was some of the classes were really interesting, really cool design and abilities on the playable characters in this game. But it's like a crazy progression system where you got to pick up all these parts to make these characters and it's probably going to be super pay to win. But uh, I don't know, maybe check out the open beta at least and don't spend any money. Skull and Bones has a closed beta happening on August 25th. This is Ubisoft's pirate game. I, is this actually still happening? Who knows? We'll find out. And then also in Shrouded, the recent survival game that we covered a couple weeks ago, they have a closed beta sometime in August, I believe it's supposed to be, but nothing has been set in stone yet. Just keep an eye out for that. And that is pretty much going to do it for this month's list. Uh, when it comes to my top picks, the games I am most interested in, the ones I'm probably going to want to play, Armored Core 6 is a no-brainer. You know, maybe I played one, the first or second Armored Core when I was a child many, many years ago. I'm not an Armored Core fan. Sorry, gatekeepers. I'm going to play Armored Core 6 anyways. Um, whatever. Wayfinder. I want to spend some more time with. I especially want to see what they've added since the early test period from a few months back. Hopefully there's more. Hopefully performance has improved and I want to see more open zone areas than I thought the two that they were supposed to be launching with. Two or three. We'll see what happens. And Atlas Fallen looks pretty cool too. I'd like to play that at least. And when it comes to the betas, I'll play Palia. I'll let you guys know all about that uh, hopefully soon. The first Descendants I do really want to play as well. And I'd love to check out Enshroud. It's going to be a busy month. There's a lot of games that look cool to play. Um, I heard some people are playing Diablo for season one, huh? How's that going for you? <laughs> they, for me, I haven't made a video about this, but um, if they just didn't seem to add enough to 
for me to feel like, yeah, I want to grind to level 100 again, uh, maybe in season two or three, or maybe just later in the season, right? Just because I don't play at the start of season doesn't mean it's over. They're lasting three months, right? So I got plenty of time. When there is a lull and not a lot of games to play, I'll probably, uh, I'll probably jump in and check out the Diablo 4 season one. I've actually recently been playing Elder Scrolls Online, N not just because I had a sponsor video, but I was playing, they had the sponsor, I made the sponsor, and then I'm like, I'm still playing. Because I don't know, the game is huge. There's so much to it. I really like it. But, you know, anyways, that's it for this month's video. Thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. And I'll see you guys in the next one. All right? Take it easy.